Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, for those of you who are visiting today, my name is Randy Frazee, and uh, Lev Beret and I get the wonderful privilege of pinch hitting for the main man, uh, Sam uh, Bernal, who is a wonderful lead pastor here. Let's give it up for Sam and the amazing work that he's doing, his wife Julie. He said, stop it. He goes, okay, one more time, then stop it. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I uh, have the privilege last week, uh, my son arrived from Dallas uh, just in time for my sermon to be over, uh, but now he's here this week to hear the whole thing. Uh, when he was a little kid, he used to fall asleep on the front pew and reminded me that it is not the words that I speak, but the life that I live that will have a greater impact on him than anything else. And the same is true for you and the people in your life. So glad to bring my son here today. Uh, he's with uh, Fonda. And uh, this is Father and Sunday. Donnie, you brought your son with you as well, correct? Yeah. So it's uh, Father Sunday. We didn't announce that, but it turned out that way. You ready to dive in? Yeah. All right. So maybe you've heard the story of Leona Helmsley. Leona Helmsley was a billionaire in New York City. Uh, she made her billions uh, in real estate, mostly hotels. And uh, she was found guilty of tax evasion. So the story is told by her attorney, Alan Dershowitz, uh, one day that they were having tea in the parlor, and the servant, that's what she called her people, the servant came in with some tea and gave it to her, and she noticed that there was a drop of water on the saucer. And so she dropped it to the ground, and it broke into a million pieces. And then right there in front of Alan, she required for him to get on the floor and apologize and then to pick up all of the pieces in front of her. When she died August the 20th, 2007, she left $12 million to her dog Trouble and she left nothing to two of her granddaughters. Because of her flamboyant personality and reputation and her tyrannical behavior, she has been dubbed for all of history the queen of mean. The queen of mean. As we continue in our series today, how to really love someone, how to really love someone according to what God wants for us, I think we can all agree that we need to become more gentle in our relationships with others. That we need to learn to handle people with care. Don't you agree? But yet it's difficult, isn't it? It is very difficult because people are annoying. I mean, I, matter of fact, I wrote a list here, and you can shout out some if I miss them. They're quirky. They're inconsiderate. They're dense. They're insensitive. They're unaware. They're weird. They're annoying. They're undisciplined. They're wrong. They're slow. Some of you are like, you're just getting started. I've got a whole bunch more. I mean, people have a way of pushing our buttons, and we would be more gentle if they weren't so fill in the blank. Yeah, we agree that we need to be more gentle, but we also agree that it is very difficult to do that consistently and chronically in our relationships with others. And you would not be alone. Years ago, I had the privilege of partnering with George Gallup Jr. of the Gallup Poll, and we identified the 30 biggest ideas in the Bible or the 30 indicators that you're getting along in your relationship with God. And we did a uh, a, a survey, a national survey in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania called the Spiritual State of the Union. And gentleness was one of the 30 key indicators that you're getting along in your journey with God. The end of the survey, gentleness was dead last. Not only for those who don't have a relationship with God, but even for followers of Jesus Christ. What is it that makes this particular virtue so hard to get at. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take a pill and become gentle people? Well, surprisingly, the concept of a pill has a lot to do with how we're going to get on with gentleness today. So what I want to do is I want to start off by defining gentleness for you from the Scriptures. When the Apostle Paul, who wrote the famous passage, out of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. He gives gentleness as one of the key indicators of your faith. He uses the Greek word pros, P-R-A-U-S. Say pros, pros. That's the Greek word that he would have written, and this is a medical term. 
It's a medical term. Have you ever noticed how some medications can cause you more harm than the very disease you have? Have you ever noticed that? You know, you have the sniffles, the doctor prescribes a medication, you go home, you turn the bottle over, and it says you could lose all your hair. Your eyes can fall out. You could have a heart attack. You could have chronic constipation. And at the end of the day, you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to take my chances with the sniffles, you know? I'm going to take my chances with the sniffles. This is not pros. Pros refers to a mild medication, a mild medication. When you're not feeling well and you take one of these pills, it'll make you feel better without upsetting your stomach. That's what gentleness is all about. A gentle person is like a mild medication, effective, but gentle on your stomach. Gives a whole new meaning to being a pill, doesn't it? Yeah. A gentle person is someone who can have great impact on your life while at the same time challenging you and confronting you, but they do it as a mild medication. So with that image in mind, I'm going to put up a definition of gentleness, just like we did last week if you were here for kindness. Anybody here last week for kindness? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Can you say the definition from last week? I am kind to others for their sake because God has been kind to me. One more time. I am kind to others for their sake because God has been kind to me. Here is a biblical definition of gentleness. Ready? I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my relationships with others. I'm getting older, so it's hard to remember things. So I think TCC, TCC. I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm. Okay, got it? Say it out loud with me. Ready? I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my relationships with others. Thoughtful, considerate, and calm make up the chemical compound for this mild medication. I want to just briefly define each one of these ideas. The word thoughtful, just simply turn it around. It means full of thought full of thought, or think before you speak. A gentle person thinks before you speak. This has been one of the toughest lessons for me. How many times my mother, how many times teachers, how many times friends have said to me, Randy, just because it comes to mind doesn't mean you need to say it out loud. You can think it, but don't always speak it. Can I get an amen? I struggle with that one. The concept of considerate or consideration means to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Before you act, take time to really consider the other person's situation. You've heard the phrase, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we would listen twice as long as we speak. We would take the time to consider their situation. As a matter of fact, it is wise. A wise person would actually, particularly in a tense conversation, but all conversations, would start off the conversation by trying to describe back to the person how they are feeling. Before you give your reaction, say, let me see if I'm getting where you're coming from. A wise person does that, and the person says, you've completely missed it. Well, will you tell me again? And finally, you say, they say, yes, you've got it. You say, now can I give a response to it? But you have taken the time to consider where they're at. So thoughtful, considerate, and calm. Calm basically refers to the manner in which you say things. It refers to the level of your voice as well as to your body language. So if we define calm, it simply means lower your voice and watch your body language. As a matter of fact, the question that tanked Americans, believers and non-believers, on the spiritual state of the union survey was, are you known as a person who raises their voice? In America, the majority of people say, I struggle with raising my voice in situations when I probably shouldn't, and I can't seem to help myself. I have the right to remain silent. I just don't have the ability, right? For example, when you're arguing with your maid in the presence of your children, your voice may seem normal to you, but you sound like a raving lunatic to your children, and it scares them. And I say that because that's the home that I was raised in. My mom and dad, late into the evening, would engage in a screaming match. And I would put the pillow over my head. And it made me feel so insecure, so scared. 
The number one thing research says that your children want from you is to know that you're unashamedly in love with one another. And when they know that, they feel a sense of security. You, for those of you who have kids still, you can send your kids to the most expensive private school, sign them up for the most uh, sports, even select sports, cart them all over the United States, buy them everything that they want. And if you and your wife you and your husband are not on the same page. All of that, my friends, is for naught. Because what they want is for you guys to get along. But more than get along, they want you to be madly in love with each other. Why not? Many of you stood up in front of a church and you said, of the 8 billion people on the planet, this is the person that I choose to be with. I love them more than anything. You've got to be calm. And lower your voice. And when you're raising kids, for example, when you raise your voice to your children and lose control, they win and they know it. You gotta learn. First of all, you gotta be on the same page with your mate. Number two, you must learn to stare. (laughs) Right, Stephen? The stare. Then you must speak plainly and you must follow through on your promises. That is a wise person. That is a person who maintains pros, mild medication, and yet effective in your relationships. Got it? Monitor your levels on the basis of others' reactions, not what you are comfortable with. Okay, let's put the definition up again. Remember, TCC. Ready? Okay, ready? Here we go. Ready? I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my dealings or relationships with others. Now, what I'd like to do is put some flesh and bone on this definition to see how it plays itself out in a relationship that David in the Old Testament had with a married couple. It's found in your Bibles in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And if you didn't bring a Bible, um, all the scriptures are in the Church Center app for you. Okay, so as you're turning there, here's the setting. Young David, at the age of 16, has been appointed and anointed by the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel. However, under the plan of God, he's going to have to wait 14 years for him to be actually inaugurated as king. And for that next 14 years, he's going to be on the run as a fugitive from the current king, Saul, who is mild, massively jealous of David's success. This was under the plan of God to grow David up to be the kind of king he needed to be, right? So we discover as David is on the run as a fugitive, he has 600 loyal warriors who are following him. David is a leader. You've heard the definition of a leader. Turn around, and if people are following you, you're a leader. If you turn around and nobody's following you, you're taking a walk, right? David had 600 mighty warriors who are with him. Keep in mind that David himself is a skilled warrior, He is the Jack Bauer of the Old Testament. When his gentleness is challenged, he could put a licking to you. So verse 1 of chapter 25 opens with the announcement of the death of the prophet Samuel. And David no no doubt felt deep respect for Samuel because he is the one when he was just a boy of 16 who saw something in him. When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. And he saw that and anointed him as the king uh, to be. And so if we put ourselves in David's shoes, he is likely a bit distressed and a little bit edgy at the news of the loss of this mighty hero of his. And David on the run comes to a place called the Desert of Maon in a little town called Carmel. Not the same place down the road where Clint Eastwood was mayor at one time, but rather an ancient town. Verses 2 and 3, we are introduced to two other characters. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail, and she was an intelligent and beautiful woman. Her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. So we learn that Nabal is wealthy, he's surly, 
which means rude, ill-humored, and cruel, and he's mean in his dealings with others. Who is Nabal? He is Leona Helmsley in a boy's body. That is who he is. We learned that Abigail is beautiful and intelligent. And I ask you, women, why does this happen all the time where you beautiful women marry a surly guy like Nabal when guys like me were available, right? <laughs> this is exactly what the people of Roseanne's hometown said when she married me. But in defense of Abigail, it was likely an arranged marriage for her. What was your excuse? Now, we're going to read a little bit here of the story. I want you to stay with me. This is a fascinating story. I can't make this stuff up. Here we go. Ready? Verse 4. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time we are at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my young man since we, have come, we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why would I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to the men, to men who are coming from who knows where? David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. David said to his men, Put on your swords. So they put on their swords, and David Put on his, uh-oh, about 400 men went with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. David doesn't even need 400 men. He could take everybody out in Nabal's all by himself. In one day, we are told in the scriptures, he took out 1,000 men all by himself. He's making a point here. Nabal is a hard pill to swallow, and he's just upset David's stomach, and he's about ready to give him a dose of his own medicine. Cue Abigail. Verse 14. One of the servants told Nabal's wife, Abigail, David sent messengers from the desert to give our master his greeting, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time that we were out in the fields, Near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us all the time. We were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what we, you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. The servant tells Abigail in verse 16 that David's men not only did not make little lamb chops out of their sheep, but he, they prevented anybody else from doing so. But Nabal isn't putting himself in David's shoes, and he speaks before he thinks, and now he's gotten his whole family in trouble, which oftentimes happens to us today. We speak before we think, and not only do we put ourselves at risk, but we put our whole family at risk. I'm going to keep going. Are you with me? Okay, interesting story. Okay, Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seas of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisin, and 200 cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. Mm. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. David had just said, It's been useless. All of my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing was of his was missing, he has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning 
I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. When Abigail saw David, she quickly cut off of her donkey and bowed down before him with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, My Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is fool. Nabal's name in the Hebrew means fool. What kind of parents names their child fool? High hopes for you, Nabal. His name is Fool, and folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I do not see the men my master sent. Now, since the Lord has always kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm you, to harm my master, be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my master be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master because he fights the Lord's battle. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God, but the lives of your enemy he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling, a little foretaste of the main battle between David and Goliath that has yet to come. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord has brought my master success, remember your servant. Let me make three observations about how Abigail is like a mild medication. Verse 23, we notice Abigail's body language. She bows down before David. Notice through the section the calming words that she uses. There's a proverb that says, soft answer turns away wrath. Notice in verse 29 how she considers David's situation. She acknowledges that Saul is tracking him down and that this is a difficult time for him. She acknowledges that. She states it. Notice down in verse 30 that she still challenges David, though. She tells him that when he becomes king, he will not want on his conscience the needless death of Nabal and all of their household, all, and, and, and least of not which is leaving Abigail a widow. Well, we look in verses 32 through 35, and we see that her approach works. Duh. And he backs down and even thanks her for preventing him from doing something that would be on his conscience and be a burden for him. She is pros. She is a mild medication. Her approach is effective in resolving what ails David without upsetting his stomach. Oh, that we could be like that. Here's how the story ends. Abigail goes home and she finds Nabal having a party and he's super duper drunk. So she waits until the morning to tell Nabal about her conversation with David. When he does, he essentially has a heart attack and dies. You can't make this stuff up, man. He has a heart attack and dies. When David gets word that Abigail, this beautiful woman, full of grace, is a widow, he's no dummy. He asks her to marry him. In the end, David gets the lamb chops, a clean conscience, and the girl. Is that not a great story, folks? Come on, that's a great story. But cannot you see here the power of being a gentle person? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who are gentle. The whole earth will belong to them. Yeah. And that's what God wants for me. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be pros. He wants you to be a pill. He wants us to help people without upsetting their stomachs. He wants us to be gentle. 
So do I need to put it on the screen or are we okay? We're good? We're good. Okay, let's say it out loud one more time. Ready? Remember TCC? I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my relationships with others. One more time. I am thoughtful, considerate, and calm in my relationships with others. I'm going to ask you uh, just for a moment, just, just have, bow your heads, close your eyes, and just kind of this internalize this right now. If gentleness is the number one struggle amongst Christians in America, then there's no doubt a bunch of people here that are struggling with it. It's straining your relationships, if not ruining them, or it has already ruined relationships in the past. But God has a vision for your life that includes being a gentler person. But you have to admit it before him and before the people in your life. And uh, one of the things we've learned about gentleness is that most people who struggle with it are not aware that they have the problem. They're not aware of it. Some people are because they have people in their life that tell them. But for some of you, your language, well, you scare people. And as a result, no one's going to talk to you because you only make it worse. But maybe in this moment, in this gentle, sacred moment, God may get a hold of our hearts and make us more gentle as people. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, verse 23 says, Against such thing there is no law, meaning that no one can force you to be gentle. It doesn't come by making yourself more gentle. What Paul's point is, is that it comes through a relationship with a gentle God in your own life. The source of gentleness is from the inside out. And that's why you being here today is important. Setting the priority to place your relationship with God at the very center of what's most important to you because this is where the nutrients of the vine of Jesus will flow into your branches to produce the fruit of the Spirit. That's what God wants for you. Do you want it for yourself? Father, we now thank you for our time together in your word. We thank you for recording such an amazing story. Many of us can likely say, well, at least I'm not like Nabal. But yet, Father, we want to, we want to develop into the kind of people that are gentle to the people around us. A mild medication that's effective in helping them become all that you want them to be, but not upsetting their stomach. This is what I want, and I sense this is what the your people in this room today want. And so we ask that you would show us mercy and grace and give us your power to do just that from the inside out. And to all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.